Thanks to each of you that have joined us today. Welcome to the KVEC New and Emerging Teacher Cadre for this month, uh, January 12th, 2022. So this is our first one of the new year. And we'd like to welcome you back and hope that you're having a uh, successful school year. I know that we've been out some and um, just getting back in session, but we're glad that you're, you're here with us and that you're able to join. So today, our, our main topic is gonna to be talking about specially designed instruction. So the very first thing that we're gonna give you an opportunity to, to, to do for this session is to tell us what your definition is of specially designed instruction. Think about what do you, how do you define specially designed instruction? What does that mean to you? Because that's one of those acronyms in special education we use all the time, but to really understand and think about it is our, gonna be our focus for today. But take one minute and think about what you, how you would define specially designed instruction. Okay, so that's our one minute timer. So I'm, we're gonna stop right there. And let's talk just a little bit about what, um, what we define specially designed instruction. We see that it's instruction designed to meet students' individualized learning goals. That's great, Candace, that's exactly it. Uh, Caitlin says what the teacher does, that's right. Um, Tracy says it's instruction that's geared towards certain student or a certain group of students, depending on that student's need. And then we have um, individualized, right? So we know that it is individualized. It's our specially designed instruction that is individualized. It's an adaptation to appropriate needs of the student. Yes, thank you, Christy. Uh, instructions directed towards specific students. Instruction based on the needs of students. Instruction that's adapted to particular students' needs. So we'll, um, we'll kind of proceed with that, but those are all correct things. It's what we're thinking about that we make it special for that individual student to give them access. So let's look at the, a, a more formalized definition of specially designed instruction. So, and I'm just gonna give you just a second to read that. We say that specially designed instruction is how we adapt it as it is appropriate. So how do we adapt the content? Um, how do we adapt our method? or how we deliver instruction. So those are all things that we do that makes it specially designed instruction or SDI. And the other piece of that is how do we make sure that we meet that need of the child that has that disability so we give them access to the general curriculum. So those are all the important parts of the specially designed instruction. And so um, we have Chastity and Doug, they're here with us from the last time. And we kind of talked about the progression of how we think through this IEP process and we thought about you know we've moved through present levels we've talked about goal development we've talked about in the content areas and then we did some goal writing now let's talk about how we select what that specially designed instruction is that's aligned to that goal so that's really what our focus is going to be today we just wanted to make sure that we understood and had that definition of what specially designed instruction is and how um, we could focus on that for today and I'm trying to this one is just a little more uh, clear definition because when we talk about the methodology or the method that we deliver instruction that's how we can make it uh, we can make that special the method that we choose for for students and so I won't read all of it but I want to just hit the highlights it's the decisions the instructional decisions we make the approach that we use the procedures that we use or the routines that we help that we use to help accelerate or enhance learning according to the goal of instruction. So that's the other thing is we have to make sure that as we're planning for specially designed instruction, what we're doing special for that student, what do we, what adaptations do we need to make or what um, instructional choices do we need to make so that we're connecting the delivery of instruction to that student's goal and the individual need of that student. And so we can think about, you know, sometimes in special education, it requires us to think outside of the box the way we normally deliver content or what we expect students to demonstrate their performance. So as we think about specially designed instruction, we can think about how that could look differently and how that way we can make sure we meet the needs of those students. And we have to be real flexible with it. So the thing we have to think about is when we talk about the specially designed instruction or SDI, we don't use the same SDI for every single student just because they have a reading goal or because they have a writing goal or because they have a math goal. We choose the specially designed instruction based on the need of that student and then what that goal says. 
And so that's what kind of defines or separates the way we can think about that specially designed instruction. So it's not the same for everyone, but it really is varied. So the next bulleted item on this slide just talks about the content and skills that we're using different structures. We might use adaptive materials. We might use modeling. With our special ed students, we probably need much more modeling, much, much more guided practice, much, much more independent practice. But with independent practice, we're talking about giving them an opportunity to practice, but then giving them an immediate feedback on that. So as we think through how we can do that, how can we increase the opportunity to allow students to see that, that delivery of instruction modeled? How can we give them more opportunities to practice? And then if we give them chances to practice, how then can we give them really quick feedback to, to know if they're getting it or not and to support their learning? The other thing is that our instruction should be around those characteristics of highly effective teaching and learning. And so that's what we know. There are best practices in effective teaching and learning. And you'll see uh, once you access this, you'll have access to all the links that are in this PowerPoint presentation. And these will be on the holler for you. So any of these that you want to go back and look at, um, they're all hyperlinked and accessible for you. But we have to think about what is effective teaching and learning. What do we know are the most effective strategies and how can we choose the strategies that we use with our students uh, from those evidence-based practices that we know are effective. And, and so that's part of that figuring out what SDI is. But uh, the next bulleted item says it's, it's what the teacher does. And I know that someone put that in the chat. I think maybe Caitlin dropped that in the chat. It's what the teacher does. What, it's what the teacher does to instruct, to assess, what do we do to reteach the student? What do we do to have, help them to be able to make progress in the general curriculum? If we have to teach them, then we have to think about what resources and materials we would use. Um, how are we gonna deliver that? How can we plan for them to have lots of opportunities for extra practice? Uh, and how are we gonna give them feedback? How are we gonna let them know how they're doing so that they're not making the same errors over and over without us jumping in there and intervening. So this is a great slide and I'm just gonna put this on the screen and give you another like 30 seconds to look at this. But this one is developed by the Kentucky Department of Education that really gives us an idea about what specially designed instruction is. One of the things I like the most about this particular slide is if you'll look at the graphic on the bottom and we see on the left-hand side, we see that you know, that's equal, that everybody has the same kind of, the same size steps, the, the what is that, a, a step, right, that puts them on a level playing form. But if we look at the one on the right, let's talk about equity, and we talk about what is it equitable and accessible for kids. So just because it's equal doesn't always mean that it's equitable. And so that's what we have to think about for our students with disabilities. What are, what are those pieces of instruction that they need to give them that platform where they can perform with the other kids uh, that are their same age with access to that general curriculum. So that's how we kind of think about that as we move forward. But, you know, so if you look on the screen, also it talks about adapting. What changes can we make to help to meet the student's needs, right? So we, how do we make that individual so we can adapt it per student, right? So if, if we're uh, giving them an assignment, Maybe not every student needs the same adaptation. Maybe we don't give every student um, two choices. Maybe not all students need that same adaptation. So we really think through what's appropriate for that kid. And then how do, some students, as we think about it, and this connects back to when we know their present levels. We know in the present level, we recognize those academic and functional uh, strengths that students have. So based on that strength, we have to think about then our instruction, how do we support them using what they're pretty good at? And then how can we continue to support that? And the same thing with content. You know, we really look at those Kentucky academic standards and think about what is it supposed to be that a, a student should be able to do at that grade level. And then we kind of think backward about, well, do they have this skill at this grade level? Do they have this skill at the grade level before, at the grade level before? And so that's how we can make some of those um, uh, adaptations, we look at that content and we kind of we we kind of backward design our plan for how we're going to teach students. And then that can accelerate them. Right. So sometimes we kind of have to back up and figure out what those skills are that they need and then move. And then that helps them uh, to accelerate. And the other thing is the method. What are we, what methods are we using? 
And so like high leverage practices, for example, if we use high leverage practices, that means that we choose those, um, those high leverage, we know that those are strategies in those areas, in the content areas that are proven to be effective, that we know there's tons of research on. If you look at that second one, it's Hattie's uh, high yield effect size. We, we know that some strategies have a greater impact on student learning than other strategies. So if we know what those are, then we can use those strategies with our students. And we hope that that would accelerate their learning more as well. And we always wanna think about those evidence-based practices and not just using things that we, we like to teach or some strategies that we've found that we've enjoyed to use in the classroom before, but we wanna make sure that those strategies are specific. And we know that those are the ones that we are, that have proven to be effective. So just to think about that, those are those three big pieces about, you know, how we're gonna improve those outcomes for students with disabilities. So that's how we're gonna adapt that content and the methodology and then let's think about how we're going to deliver it. So we, we're going to change. We're going to look at those strategies we know are real effective, and then how we're going to get to give that information to students. And that means we want to increase the engagement of students. And what we mean about that is we need to have our students with disabilities having many, many more opportunities to respond, right? Because they need much more practice than the kids, some of the other kids in the classroom. And lots of times our kids they get the least amount of practice because maybe they don't know the answer or they're afraid to say the answer or they don't want to be uh, feel like they um, are unsuccessful in the class. So a lot of times they'll pull back and maybe not engage in learning or not be part of discussions or are kind of isolated from that. So if we think of ways that we can get our kids involved and different ways to have them respond to answers to questions um, for them to demonstrate their learning then that gives us a better opportunity to really know what they can do. If it's a barrier for reading, for example, and they're, they're doing really well in social studies, how can they demonstrate what they know in social studies, even if they have that barrier in reading? And so that's, that's the good thing about specially designed instruction. It allows you to kind of think outside of the way we traditionally do that. Not everything, um, always, every time would have to be, you know, a a uh, multiple choice test, but how can we also give them an opportunity to build a model or do a, a visual presentation or could they do a, um, you know, a slide presentation? How, how can we allow them to demonstrate what they know that's a little different than the way we've done it before? So we can measure what they do know rather than what their than to focus on what their deficit is. And so those are kind of just some big pieces about specially designed instruction that I wanted to talk about. This I love is a graphic and it kind of tells us where does specially designed instruction fit at? Where do we, where do we fit it in? And we see here on this one, um, you know, we have to make adaptations. We have to modify the content, the method or delivery to make sure that we're meeting that individual need of that student. And I think maybe um, it was Dean Paul that told me the other day, you know, one of the things that um, he'd read recently in that John O'Connor book he talks about what good specially designed instruction is, is that if you had to answer the question, what are you doing that's special? If you're answering this question to a parent, what are you doing for my child that's special, that's different than what every other kid's getting? How do we answer that question? And so then that's how we move into those. We have to think about we're choosing high leverage practices. We're using a really explicit instructional approach and we're giving them intensive instruction. So we base those strategies on that model. We know that we choose something that's evidence, research-based or evidence-based strategy. We teach it very explicitly so that kids, we know that there's not room for error, that we're very, very explicit. And we're gonna talk about that on through this session. And then that that's very intensive, that we give them that focus time to be able to answer and respond and that we can correct them and give them feedback as we move along through that process of instruction. Then this, this, slide here is really about how do we know then what specially designed instruction that we should choose. And so two things that we can really focus on and remember is one is we choose the specially designed instruction that's related to the goal. So again, that goes back to we know what the student strengths are in the present levels. We know their area of concern. Then we write a goal. And that goal is going to be around that area that we want for them to improve. We have to think about what specially designed instruction we're gonna be able to, to select that makes sense and that's appropriate for students 
to, to align with the goal that we have for them. And that all of this SDI shouldn't be the same for every single student. <clears throat> and when you think about um, like specially designed instruction for reading, you know, there's always paired reading and choral reading and echo reading and all of those uh, same ones that we use over and over and over. But as we're thinking about it, we let's really think about the goal and what, what the student needs in order to be able to achieve that goal. So sometimes when you look at an IEP, it's kind of disconnected. You could have a goal and it might be a comprehension goal, but some of the, um, the especially the SDI isn't aligned to that same comprehension or there may be a fluency goal, but then we're in there and we see paired echo and choral reading, or we see um, direct instruction and comprehension strategies, right? But there's a disconnect. So always as you're developing that IEP, make sure it makes sense. Look back and say, does that make sense? Does that, that instruction I selected, does it match what the student needs? And is it, does it connect to the goal that they have? And if you ask yourself that question and you continuously use that IEP to drive what you do every day in your instruction, then, then it'll make more sense. It'll make more sense for the student. Uh, it'll make more sense for you as the teacher. And it really tells you what your next steps are for instruction. So it really helps us and guides us through that process. Um, and so we have the schoolhouse document. And I know we probably shared that with you all before, but in the schoolhouse document, it looks like this over here on the bottom uh, right-hand corner of my screen. And it says um, IEP and lesson plan development handbook. I know we keep referring back to it all the time when we do these sessions, but it really is something that you would want to have right there in your hand when you're thinking about what specially designed instruction you can choose in the different content areas to support your student. So when you're writing an IEP, it's good to have a copy of this or at least have an electronic copy on your computer. And uh, you can just use that to kind of help you know what to do in some of those areas. And then um, you have your IEP guidance document. Then that way we're really connecting what we're doing in the IEP with the instruction we do every day. So it kind of, it brings back together the whole, are we getting the compliance part and are we getting the, the teaching and learning piece? So it really puts those two pieces together. And so I'm gonna stop right there and I'm gonna let switch over. And I think Chastity's gonna talk a little bit about um, a reading goal. And then we're gonna talk about specially designed instruction and how we select um, the right SDI based on that goal for a student. Uh, so what, what we're going to do is talk about the reading because uh, Dion started out doing just the general SDI and we have uh, we're carrying through our goals because each month when we talk about this we've taken you through uh, establishing the baseline with your Form it with your assessments and then writing your goal and then implementing that goal into progress monitoring. And now we want to, um, just to have that cohesiveness, <clears throat> um, we're going to use this goal that we had used last month. So with this one that we had used before, it is a reading fluency goal. Uh, and this is copied from the other ones just as a reminder. And I, we noted the baseline information there that she was reading 105 words. Uh, correct words per minute. In our analysis that we had written last month that we had noted an instructional change uh, based on her progress, she had hit a plateau and we implemented an, an instructional change and what it was decoding, uh, a decoding strategy uh, that could be looking for uh, known words inside of words and chunking. So before we go, I go farther into that, let's talk about what that looks like a little bit because we talk about and we throw these terms out of what SDI is and names of it, names of it and, and we say fluency strategies and decoding strategies, but sometimes we don't really go into explaining what that is exactly. So with the, but the first one looking for known words, inside words is one I think, you know, if you just look in when, they're, when they have a bigger word, if you can look in that and you're talking um, and you can recognize those smaller word words that's inside of words, that's what that is. Um, and it's just, um, it's a way you can break it out when um, throwing back to the syllabification, when you can break those words apart sometimes um, and like compound words and things like that, you're gonna be able to see words in smaller words inside bigger words and that will help them recognize those and then they can apply it and know the 
the bigger words. Uh, chunking is also just um, the word parts if they, um, and then blending those word parts together. Like, uh, you know, you can do prefixes and then the suffixes or uh, the digraphs, things like that. Those in the, or even word parts or compound words. When you can separate those and pro, uh, focus on pronouncing each section of that word, and then you can blend that together, then that is um, a strategy that they can use. It's just you're kind of dissecting words and then putting them back together. So that's what those strategies look like. And when we finished the, at the end of the analysis, when we talked about it last month, you know, we, she was trending upward toward meeting her goal. And so we hadn't made any instructional changes. So just for today, like we're going to say that she has hit another plateau and what do we need to do? Because sometimes, you know, as they progress through, they do hit plateaus and you do to need to make those uh, changes for one reason or, or, or the other. So, and, and also like Dion had mentioned, you want to make sure that your strategies match your goal because, and um, for example, um, you don't want to like instru um, direct instruction or uh, ex um, explicit instruction on how to use a graphic organizer. For, you know, that would be more of like a reading comprehension goal. So this would, you, so a um, strategy, the use of a graphic organizer for a fluency goal would not be appropriate. So just want to make sure that would be like a non-example per se of what you would use. So you don't want to use those. So I know sometimes we, I mean, that that is a the graphic organ the instruction for a graphic organizer is a good strategy but make sure that it matches the goal that your student has um so ones that would match the fluency would be what we had uh, down here some additional strategies would be the word analysis strategies um and this is one of my favorites it's uh you use your prefixes and suffixes and compound words and you um if you know, again, breaking that part into the syllables, and if you know what the prefix is, A, that you can say the prefix, and B, you know what the, the prefix means, then that would help you A, to pronounce the word, and then also understand the meaning of those words that will help with the vocabulary, which also not, goes into helping with that fluency. If you know the, understand those words and know what the vocabulary is, then you could read those more efficiently and it will increase your reading fluency. And the same with the suffixes. Uh, I just, that is that is one of my, my favorites is being able to break those words apart and, um, and be able to use those and the morphology piece of it. The other one, which leads into the pre-teaching of the vocabulary, I think that's another big one. And I, I, I chose these because I think um, sometimes we overlook the importance of vocabulary and pre-teaching those words to those students, especially when they are in regular classes, like in their math and science and social studies classes, they have those vocabulary words for the units and um, sometimes they get glossed over just hit, you know like a light touch on them we say uh, but sometimes our kids need a little bit more in-depth instruction in those vocabulary words and uh, if we just take just a few minutes to go over those and they truly understand what those words are it would help them understand those concepts and be able to increase their reading fluency which ultimately increases their comprehension um, because it doesn't help, you know, if the kid can pronounce the word, they, if they don't understand what those words mean, then it's not going to help them when they need to know that concept. And then uh, the last couple that I have uh, listed here would be repeated readings and choral readings. Those are two more uh, fluency strategies that you could practice. It's um, that helps them just, you know, just practicing, practice, practice. And uh, sometimes I've, um, I've had a couple of teachers ask me, like, well, the repeated readings, is it just memorization? It's not really that they're learning it. And, and part of that is, but just the, the repetition of seeing those words over and over in print 
that that just helps them get that um, automaticity to be able to just when they they see it they know it instead of having to apply the decoding strategies to sound out those words because eventually you want them to be able to just look at it and and read it without you know and moving on just like you're learning your multiplication facts it just increases the speed and it helps them ultimately with the comprehension which is the ultimate goal for reading and uh and then the last one is the choral reading and that's the one for uh they can read you would be the person to to lead that and then they you would read and what you're doing at the same time is modeling the your rate and your tone and an appropriate um for and what that's going to sound like the kids can say the follow along with you they say the words that they know and then eventually it, as you go through that then they can pick up on those words and that's just an just an additional strategy that you can use so all of all of these that's listed match directly with fluency Cass, if I could just interject just for a second, um, I really like the, the, the discussion around vocabulary. I think it's so, so vital for our students. Uh, just thinking about being a new teacher and learning a new language uh, and all the acronyms that go with special ed, if you, if you make that connection. And then the other thing is, it's very important that we understand how the general intelligence piece speaks to this particular determination of specially designed instruction. Uh, so if we know that a student has memory issues, that can really impact comprehension and the ability to learn. And, and so we, we need to think through that lens. And then if they have visual spatial relationship issues, uh, you know, how's that going to impact their ability to make sense of what they see and that type of thing and, and really um, applying that general intelligence to that determination and really looking for some real clues into how they best learn is a big piece of what needs to be included in the present level. You know, making the connection between what's needed for each individual student. And, and one key too, I think that we have to realize is this is not a laundry list. This is not something we just pick and choose from a, from a drop down box. This is something that we really diagnose and that we really intentionally look at what the student needs. This is the most important thing we do really. I did want to say one more thing, Chas, on that. So like what, what Chastity did was she looked specifically at the goal that's here for Karen, right? So she was trying to think about Karen, presenting Karen with a fifth grade passage. So we're trying to get Karen to be fluent. We want her to read 195 words per minute fluently on a fifth grade passage. So that's why she selected those things like word analysis strategies with prefixes and suffixes and compound words. So she wouldn't select things like understanding consonant vowel consonant patterns, or she wouldn't understand uh, you, maybe using words and phrases, whatever. But she specifically selected that because we know that that's what Karen needs, right? So that's what, you know, Dean Paul was even saying as well as it's not just a laundry list, but it has, it really makes sense to me. So if I know if a kid's at fifth grade and they're reading at the fifth grade level, they're probably beyond those foundational skills like, you know, constant vowel, constant words. But she's really now trying to push forward to knowing what prefixes and suffixes are and figuring out how to attack words. And so that helps us understand that that progression of how kids learn to read. Right. That goes along with the standards work, too. But that helps us to kind of see what's appropriate. So if I would ask myself, do that specially designed instruction make sense for Karen? And do you, and, and, and that's what I would ask myself. And so, um, and, and I, I, and right now, you know, I know that she's starting out at 105 words a minute. So again, it's just about really just making sense, going back and asking yourself, does that make sense? And will that get, will that make the kid help the kid accelerate that learning? Okay, and then looking at the writing, we did not have one, a writing goal for December that we talked about doing the uh, progress monitoring. We just had the reading, math, and behavior last month. But this is a goal that we used earlier when we were establishing baseline and writing goals. And so this one is one about Harry and he's using um, writing, using conventions with 80% accuracy. Now, writing conventions, what that that includes your spelling your punctuation and grammar and uh so when 
we're looking at those, we determined that a, a writing checklist would be the best way to check uh, to look at that, which I know we're not talking about methods of measurement. We're talking about SDI, but I do, I just want, since we didn't talk about this one last month, I wanted to um, just review it just a little bit, just to refresh you. Uh, and what we did is those are things that you can have. Um, you can make your a teacher made checklist, or you can find like what you're wanting to look for. So if that if he wrote sentences, then the checklist might say, did he use a capital letter at the beginning of the sentence? Did he? And then you would check that. Did he put the correct punctuation at the end? And then you would check that. And then each thing that you're looking for, you know, you would he would check that you would put a check or an X or leave it blank. And then at the end, how many uh, items he wrote correctly in that paragraph, then you could look at your checks and put the number. And that's how you would look at, that's how you would quantify that to get your percent, percentage on the method of measurement. So going back to the SDI, which is what we're talking about today. So the baseline information for Harry is he was using conventions with 60% accuracy in his goals, we want him to do 80. And we, uh, so some of the things that you can do with this, with this one, and I know writing is always the more difficult of the two between reading and writing, and it's harder to uh, find things for writing, but with writing, um, some going into strategies for this one, for the conventions, the first one I put uh, for dictation, because when you do that, and, and dictation is basically, uh, you are you are writing what the kid says. You know, I know that sounds like a scribe, but if, if you're doing that as an accommodation, then that would be obviously the scribe, but when you're doing it for a teaching with a lesson, you're, you are dictating that. And what, what that may look like would be, because you're also modeling what that's, you know, appropriate writing. So for example, you, you could have a small group and you would be, uh, you would give them a prompt to, a, a writing prompt. So as they would tell you what they want want you to write you would write it exactly so and then you would write your start out writing your sentence I would put it on chart paper and write you know with whatever they say and then I would say okay talk it out you do a think the think aloud strategy I'm going to start out my sentence I'm with a capital letter so and then and then you write it and it's okay after you write your sentence then this um I'm going to put a period at the end of this sentence because this is a sentence that's telling me it's not asking me a question it's telling me something so I'm going to put a period at the end of my sentence so as you are dictating what they say you are talking through that and <clears throat> giving them so at the same time you're modeling the correct way that those paragraphs should be written but you're also talking through that and that think aloud strategy is getting them to think and then as you go through then you can going back to that explicit instruction then you have modeled the first part and then you can go through and say okay let's do this together and then with your next after you write two or three sentences and you can start and say okay before we get started in the next sentence what's the first thing that we need to do and then have them talk it through with you and then say and then have you know they'll say I need to start with a capital letter and then if you have some you some of the vocabulary words or some of your spelling words that's in there say how do you spell this word what's the correct spelling for this word and things like that so that's how you can model that process and get through and and then you can have that as an example for them to look at later when they do their own writing the other strategy would be um, the explicit instruction just like a that in sentence writing, um, that one is just one, uh, just very, well, explicit, <laughs> but it's very structured on exactly, you know, what those grammar rules are, and when do they need to use capital letters, when do they need to, you know, all of those kind of things, and just the repetition for that, and also um, throwing in that multi-sensory to those spelling words is, and um, with the that multi-sensory approach to reading and writing goes uh it, it helps with that spelling and they can use um just you know you the, the different 
um, strategies for that. Um, but those are the multi-sensory approach to those spelling words. It helps with the spelling. All right, I'm gonna move to behavior and, and turn it over to Mr. Smith. Thank you, Ms. Dion. Uh, as uh, Ms. Chastity was saying, we're, we're following through with Karen and uh, our goal for Karen was when given a task or direction, she'll begin to, the task within one minute as measured by latency recording form three times a week. Uh, we looked at her baseline information and it was uh, evidenced by the latency recording form. Her average starting time was uh, four minutes after instruction was given. So we collected data and she kind of, like I said, was, was all over the place. Uh, she dropped from four minutes to three minutes, back up to uh, two minutes, or down to two minutes, back up to three minutes. And then we decided to implement a self-monitoring checklist. And then after implementing the self-monitoring checklist, uh, her uh, own task or time to begin task uh, minutes dropped. So uh, she was making progress. And a self-monitoring checklist is a, a way that allows the students to systematically reflect on their behaviors and record it. And this increases awareness of their behaviors and the teacher expectations. There's a uh, website, interventioncentral.org, that may be uh, beneficial to you to, to check out to see, uh, see what ideals and so, some suggestions are there. So some additional SDI, SDI strategies to address the students' needs that uh, we may look at. There's an explicit instruction on how to respond, uh, such as uh, cueing, such as verbal, nonverbal, visual, pictures, photos, et cetera. And uh, with these, uh, providing multiple opportunities and ways to respond helps all of our students, not just our special ed students, but helps all students in the classroom with engagement and also with uh, that opportunity to show what they know without uh, being embarrassed, I guess you could say. So what you would want to do, though, you'd want to uh, teach, model, and practice and provide immediate positive corrective feedback to the uh, opportunity or the way that you have your students respond and make sure that they understand it. So for instance, uh, we could use a thumbs up or thumbs down. You know, uh, we could use a, a, a picture or a flip card. Green means yes, uh, uh, red means no something like that. You could even have our students, some of our students that need those visual supports could point to pictures as well. So just so that you teach the students how to use those response or those opportunities to respond and, and what you expect from them. Uh, so our next SDI that we may look at is making sure that we present material in a logical and sequential manner uh, with explicit cues to shift from one aspect to the next. Since she has difficulty beginning task or getting on task after instruction was given, uh, some of the additional things that you may think about is maybe you make an outline for writing tasks or homework assignments or multiple step assignments in order to keep her, keep her on task. Uh, you may also want to give simple written directions. And if you're given oral directions, speak slowly and, and sp um, precisely. Uh, you may use graphs or other visual aids and explain out loud what those graphs mean and how to use those. Uh, provide a checklist or a rubric at the beginning of the assignment or at the beginning of class, and then provide details on what the, how the, sub, uh, the assignment will be graded. Uh, also give an outline of lessons or notes for the students. So just any way that you can break those bigger lessons or bigger assignments down into small manageable steps or chunks uh, would assist in uh, providing Karen with the ability to get on task uh, quicker. And then uh, uh, also we looked at using direct instruction uh, as far as using advanced organizers. Advanced organizers are tools you aid students in understanding uh, new information by connecting what they already know to that information. Uh, advanced organizers uses their existing knowledge that they have to tie into what they're going to learn. And uh, some types of advanced organizers such as narratives, expository and skimming focus more on previewing and organizing new information before it's presented. Uh, some of the ones that we wanna focus on are the uh, types of organizers that, that fall under graphic, uh, a KWL and or analogies and uh, metaphors. And a KWL is a, a graphic organizer uh, or an advanced organizer that lets you know what the student's background knowledge is. So uh, if you've never used one of KWLs, you just simply divide a, a sheet of paper into three sections. One is what uh, the student knows. Another is what the student uh, wants to learn or want to know. And then the third, the L, is what did the student learn? And then you could, of course, you're going to do the what they know and what they want to know 
And then after they fill those out, you can go over and discuss those in class and what did you learn from this assignment? Those are just some additional uh, SDI strategies that we could do, use to address uh, uh, Karen's uh, on time or, or time to start task. And then of course, now you're not gonna use all these strategies at once. You're gonna you know, pick one or two or, or, and then implement those and mm -hmm. see what kind of you know, success you have with those. If they work, continue using them. If they don't work, then you wanna change that strategy up. So just, just don't think just because I put that on the IEP, you know, that you're tied to that strategy. So yeah, you may want to uh, start using that strategy, but if it's not working, then of course you're going to change it, change your uh, approach. Doug, I was going to ask you a question. So I was thinking about, you know, because behavior is a little more difficult to kind of think about that, especially design instruction. And when we're thinking about explicit instruction, um, for example, the first SDI strategy we chose was explicit instruction on how to respond to cueing. So if this student, if Karen's having trouble, um, beginning on task so would I first teach her maybe how to use a visual cue or a nonverbal cue or or a picture could would that be a way that I could think about beginning to support this student I mean you, you see what I'm saying so you might not take all of those SDI strategies but you might choose one of those and try that with her and would that be able to guide me on what to do with her in the classroom or in the resource room or when I'm supporting that student well, of course, you know what I'm going to say. You got to make sure you've got some type of relationship or some, you know, some kind of rapport with that student. Uh, but if you could use a, a signal or nonverbal cue, you know, something that doesn't draw attention to Karen or attention to the student that you're working with, you know, so it don't, doesn't make a, a big scene in your classroom, then of course you'd want to use nonverbal or visual cues. Uh, you could probably try something like taping an index card uh, to the desk. Uh, that would have the steps that, you know, that the student should follow or the, the uh, uh, self-monitoring checklist that you develop, have that taped to the student's desk so she knows I have my pencil, I have my paper, I have my book open, I'm looking at my teacher, I'm following along. Uh, so, I mean, again, it goes back to what are the needs of the student and what kind of rapport do you have with that student? And, you know, what have I, you know, what have I already tried or, or, or what, what does the student prefer? You know, how do they prefer to be directed to get on task or whatever? Okay. Let's talk about the same, the same example with Karen. So we're in this particular goal, we're, we're saying that Karen has a one digit subtraction problem. So we're saying that when we give her 10, she's gonna correctly solve subtraction problems with 80% accuracy. So we know that she's currently able to solve subtraction problems with about 30% accuracy. So if we are going to improve accuracy on um, subtraction problems in mathematics, and so if she, we know that she's having trouble with um, subtraction overall, what might be a specially designed instruction strategy that I might use? Try to think of one for mathematics that you might use to help her with subtraction we really think about what that goal is that she's working on. And I'll flip back to that page. Um, we're, we know that she has one digit subtraction issues. So part of those things that we're gonna do is how are we gonna let her, um, how are we gonna teach her? How are we gonna teach her or, or model for her how to solve those problems? So manipulatives are great, blocks are great. Um, Unifix cubes are all kinds of strategies that we can use, but that's what's special for this child. So if we're talking about Karen, that would be what is special for Karen in the area of mathematics. So that's great. Um, I'm going to kind of move just a little more quickly and talk about explicit instruction. And so we've talked about explicit instruction. Chastity talked about it. Doug talked about it. We, we write that in our IEP goals because we'll say explicit instruction in uh, whatever we're doing. So what explicit instruction is, is that we are really using this model of I do it, we do it, and you do it. And so that's the teaching practice we use for kids. And that means the I do it part is that modeling. So we as the teacher model that. Um, we can have the students model along with us, but we are giving them that exemplar or that model of what that should look like. And then we give them an opportunity then to work and solve some problems with us, right? So we give them that First, that model of this is me thinking through this process. I know Chastity referred to it a minute ago. Just that thinking about how we, we talk through that process. 
um, and, and let kids hear us talk through that. They need to hear that thinking process that we have. And that's why modeling is so good. So when we think about the especially design instruction we choose, we think about explicit instruction in that way. What we're saying is we're going to do it and show them exactly how to do it. So there's no, so that they don't make, a, make an error or misconception with that. Um, another, so then we're going to let them practice. So that's the we do it part. So in mathematics, it is critically important, but I, I know Chastity will argue in reading and writing, it's just critically, critically important that manipulatives, using those tools or those multi-sensory tools, but that we allow them the opportunity to practice with those manipulatives, right? So we're monitoring and it's that careful watch that we have as we're watching kids do that together as the we do it part. And then, you know, we might have to do an example and we see that kids are not getting it and we have to do it again and we have to do it again and we have to do it again. And that's, so that is that piece that we don't just put this, these problems out in front of them um, so solving one digit subtraction problems, but that we model how we do that. So let's say if we're putting Unifix cubes up and we might put them on our ladybug or on our inner, uh, our, our inner right board on the screen and we move those models. We let them see that real concrete model of what they're looking at and we practice along with them. Right then we see if they're making a mistake or if they're making errors. And if they are, we can correct those immediately. Uh, but they have to see those good solid models. And our students with disabilities need to see that concrete, those models. And that's part of the big piece with the mathematics is that they have to first be able to see it concrete before they can get to that semi-concrete, then they get to that abstract. And it's the same way um, for a lot of the strategies that we teach our students. But we give them then, we have to think about what, what can we give them, like manipulatives, what other instructional tools, like we talked about over here, somebody put in there, you know, the use of a calculator. There might be, that's appropriate. We might have to give them a hundreds charts. We might have to give them an organizer, a graphic organizer, but we wouldn't just give them any graphic organizer. There's gonna be a graphic organizer that's specific for that goal. So if I have a goal for a child teaching them um, a subtraction, then I'm gonna give them a graphic organizer that may help them keep that in, that helps them organize when they uh, subtract, right? So it's very specific. So it's not just a graphic organizer, but it's a graphic organizer that I explicitly teach them to use for subtraction. So that's kind of how it becomes much more personalized for the student. Uh, other things I think about, remember we go back to that thinking about when we were talking about specially designed instruction, is it the way we teach it? Is it how we adapt the content of it or how we deliver it, right? Goes All those are the, the thinking that we do around especially uh, uh, design instruction so we you know, follow Dion, that um, not to interrupt but thinking about uh, Anita Archer she talks a lot about memory uh, cognitive uh, overload or cognitive load um, for students with disabilities they have a real hard time uh, you, you have to be careful not to give them too much too quickly or to give them a worksheet with several things mixed up on it and then just walk away. You have to supervise that practice. And, uh, you know, we talk a lot about practice and, and, and feedback being, uh, you know, a, a key uh, special design instruction uh, concept, if you will, or one that uh, should be on everyone's list. So, you know, when you, if you're if chunking work and keeping it kind of even more simple than you think it should be sometimes is very important for students with disabilities. All right, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to derail there. Oh no, I'm just gonna be respectful of time. So I'm gonna kind of move just a little more quickly, but thank you, Dan Paul, I think that's a good important point. Uh, here are more of those must haves when we teach explicitly. It's important that we know the difference between explicit instruction and direct instruction and knowing the language when we talk about SDI, because we have a lot of acronyms in special ed and it's hard to keep up with all of those. So sometimes you just have to stop and look it up, research a little bit of it, try to figure out what some of those really mean. And these are just some examples of what you could do with explicit instruction for um, mathematics. Uh, and then this one's just a graphic talking about uh, things that you can give students. You know, this one might be a graphic organizer that you give student in mathematics so that they can have a concrete representation, a semi-concrete, and then they solve problems abstractly. So this could be an organizer. So this is a particular example of a graphic organizer. Um, and then I'm gonna flip on over here and, and then just talk about, you know, knowing the difference between, um, you know, calc math calculation and math reasoning and what 
teacher needs to be do, what the teacher can do and then what the student might need back to that specially designed instruction. Here's our, here is the um, screen with all of our emails and uh, you all have access to uh, um, contact us at any time. And if there's any way we can support you, well, feel free to reach out and uh, to uh, contact us and we're happy to help. Thanks to each of you all.